In this video, we'll continue the discussion on gram-positive bacteria, specifically looking at the gram-positive cocci, or circular shape. Within the gram-positive cocci, there are a few important genus and species to discuss. Remember, these bacteria will stain purple under gram stain due to the peptoglycan cell wall. The different proteins and sugars found in the bacterial wall allow the purple stain to set and not be washed away by alcohol rinse when prepared on a slide. It's also important to distinguish between the types of bacteria within the circular shaped genre because they will have different sensitivities to different antibiotics. Obviously, bacterial resistance has gained a lot of popularity lately, and it's important to know which bacteria we are treating in order to give the most effective treatment. Staphylococcus and Streptococcus are the more common genus within the gram-positive cocci, leading to a wider variety of ailments. We also have the Enterococcus, which is a less common type of bacteria, but still causes severe human disease. We can use specialized tests, such as hemolysis testing, to differentiate between these different species within the same family. There's alpha, beta, and even gamma hemolysis. Hemolysis basically describes the way that the bacteria can break down cells, particularly red blood cells, when put on an agar plate. Staphylococcus also has an enzyme called catalase that allows it to evade immune cells. The function of catalase is to help break down hydrogen peroxide. This hydrogen peroxide is used by certain immune cells uh, to help fight off the bacteria and other microbes. So by breaking down the peroxide, by using this enzyme, the bacteria can escape the immune system. Staphylococcus generally forms in clusters, which can help separate out this genus when visualized under the microscope. Streptococcus, on the other hand, is usually in chains. As we also note here, it is catalase positive. Now for the types of diseases, Staphylococcus aureus is going to be one of the larger disease groups here. It has some of the most associated infections, and it's one you'll hear about more commonly in clinics. Staph aureus has a more dangerous variant called MRSA, or methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. These can cause severe infections and are resistant to many of the antibiotics that work against normal, sensitive strains of staph. This is why we have to be cautious when prescribing antibiotics to patients or over-prescribing. However, its normal vector is on the skin and the human nose, so it's already on many of us in the general public. Not all of this inoculation is MRSA, but the microbe is found everywhere. Obviously due to this, if you have a skin abrasion, nasal congestion, or nasal inflammation, it can lead to the bacteria inoculating other sites within the body. One of the diseases it can cause that isn't so intuitive based on where it lives is endocarditis. This is an infection of the inner heart lining. However, if you think of it, cuts in the skin, whether it be a penetrating wound or surgical incision, or even a simple scrape on the elbow can lead to the staph getting through the skin. Once through this barrier, it may enter the bloodstream. Once it's in the bloodstream, its catalase enzyme can help it, along with other virulence factors, to evade the body's immune system. It travels through the blood until it reaches the heart, sets up shop in the heart, and then you have endocarditis. It can also cause toxic shock syndrome, which is one of the many skin pathologies that can be found from this infection. Notice here, it basically looks like the skin is peeling off. It resembles a very, very bad burn, and is caused by a particular toxin which is a superantigen, protein A. The superantigen can cause fever, hypotension, tachycardia. Since the skin is no longer there to protect you from other bacteria that might be on or around the skin, it can lead to new infections. Impetigo is one of the many skin infections of importance. Generally, this is seen more in children. You can picture a kid with a runny nose. Perhaps they touch another part of their body, wipe their nose, and inoculate the area with staph that was otherwise on their body. It leads to a crusty lesion, often described as a honey-colored crust, which is a mixture of mucus and staph aureus. Though the nose is the more common area to find this infection, it can also be found on the arms or legs. Think of a child running through the woods, scraping up their legs with branches and other plant life, and the bacteria that's already on the skin then infects these new scrapes, and you have impetigo. Staphylococcus scolded skin syndrome, similar to toxic shock syndrome in some dermatologic appearances, causes a diffuse full body reaction, as well as desquamation of the skin. Also, the Nikolsky sign can cause a top layer of skin to bubble up and slough off, which can induce further infection. More specifics about the different types of disease states will be described in the next video. For now, let's try to remember all the diseases that are associated with each particular bacteria. With osteomyelitis, note that anything that infects the skin and the tissue, if it goes deep enough, can probably infect the bone as well. 
Alternatively, it might spread from elsewhere in the body via the bloodstream. A patient may present with a superficial skin infection from a few weeks ago. Maybe it's even healing on the outside, but the bacteria has already penetrated into the wound. Anything that allows for a deep enough penetration can allow the bacteria to get to the bone tissue and then spread and cause further bone infection. If staph can be found in and around the nose, then it makes sense that the oral pharynx and sometimes the respiratory system can be infected. Tracheitis is one of the inflammations of the tube leading from the larynx to the respiratory system. Typical presentations will consist of a sore, red, edematous throat. We also have cellulitis on this list of common diseases for this pathogen. This is yet another type of skin infection, and it is important to note the differences between cellulitis, impetigo, and other types of skin infections. This will be described a little bit more in future images that will help depict the different depths of infection and describe the types of infections. As mentioned in the etiology for tracheitis, we can also develop pneumonia from Staph aureus. Though not as common as many of the other bacteria that cause pneumonia, coughing and breathing can sometimes dislodge moisture and bacteria from higher up in upper respiratory tract, allowing it to disseminate further down into the lungs, causing pneumonia. Next to cover is Staphylococcus epidermidis. Staph epi obviously likes the epidermis, or the skin. We see a lot of similar superficial skin infections, but it's not as common as Staph aureus. It doesn't have as many of the important virulence factors. These virulence factors will be covered in more detail in the distinguishing features here. However, Staph epidermidis is another cause of the severe cardiac disease, endocarditis. Although any skin lesion can potentially lead to an infection with this bacteria, a common demographic is an IV drug user as they'll pierce their skin and push bacteria living on the surface of their skin into the tissue and into the bloodstream. Next, and last for the staph bugs, we have Staphylococcus saprophyticus, which is one of the bacteria found in the urogenital tract. Thus, it's going to infect the urogenital anatomy. Due to this, there is a gender difference seen in the prevalence rates with this bacteria. It's going to affect women more than men due to the obvious anatomic differences between the genders. This includes having a shorter urethra and a decreased distance from the perianal region to the urogenital region. One of the sequelae of this is a higher potential for UTI, or urinary tract infection. Here we see a splayed out depiction of the renal system. The urethra, bladder, ureters, and even kidney may be susceptible to infections spread by Staph sapro. A UTI may lead to serious retrograde infections in the kidney as well, called pyelonephritis which can lead to renal scarring. Another sequela of upper renal system infections is kidney stones. Because the bacteria is a urease producer, it can lead to ammonia production and mineral precipitation in the kidney. The precipitin is called a struvite stone. This is not to be confused with a different kind of stone caused by a different kind of bacteria called a staghorn stone. This will be discussed in a later module. Streptococcus pyogenes is also a very important and versatile microbe. Like Staph aureus, there is a bit to cover here. It is also found in the skin and throat, so there's going to be a lot of overlap in the diseases and presentation between this and Staph aureus. However, we'll focus on the main diseases of importance. First, we have scarlet fever, which is classified as a systemic infection. It is generally in children, and some of the presentation include swollen red tongue, general sick symptoms, and an erythematous dry skin. The skin color is why it's known as scarlet fever. The skin texture is dry and likened to sandpaper. In fact, I saw a case like this in pediatrics and the skin did feel just like sandpaper. The scarlet fever toxin is called exotoxin A, and this leads to the inflammatory response that causes the sequelae seen here. For anyone that has had a strep infection early on in life, rheumatic heart disease might be a concern. It is a strep-related heart disease that generally affects the individual in later decades of life. It is caused by a specific hypersensitivity reaction called HS2. This basically causes your own immune cells to attack your heart valves, causing mitral stenosis. The immune attack leads to fibrosis and scarring of the valve. This mitral stenosis ultimately leads to a valve needing to be replaced in some instances. This hypersensitivity is thought to be due to molecular mimicry. However, if you've had a strep infection before, such as strep throat, don't fear. Most patients, in the developing world anyway, receive antibiotics, which prevents this disease from occurring later on in life. Here we see impetigo again, as we saw with Staph aureus. I'll save you from repeating all the boring details, just remember that it's a superficial skin infection, and is much more likely to be caused by Staph aureus.
Kidney disease can also be caused by strep pyogenes, in particular post-strep glomerular nephritis. Like rheumatic heart disease, PSGN is caused by a hypersensitivity reaction. However, this time it is caused by a hypersensitivity 3 reaction. This mechanism is not from molecular mimicry like we saw in HS2, but is from an antibody antigen complexes being formed and deposited into the tissue. When these complexes are trying to be filtered out of the blood, they stick to the renal tissue and damage the glomerulus. This irritation can cause nephritis. This complication of strep is concerning because unlike rheumatic heart disease, it is not prevented by prophylaxis with antibiotic treatment. Only a small percentage of patients will develop PSGN, but it can ultimately lead to renal failure, so anyone presenting with the symptom should be monitored closely. Pharyngitis is pretty self-explanatory with strep infection. The strep throat is as common vernacular outside of the medical circles. Most people don't realize that all of these diseases are caused by the same bacteria. I know I didn't before med school. Keep an eye out for throat pain, redness, and fever symptoms. PANDAS is a unique type of disease. It actually stands for Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorder Associated with Streptococcus. Whew, what a mouthful. Active associated disease with a bacterial etiology, which is pretty rare. Basically, this disease presents after a strep infection in a child who will then develop these OCD-like symptoms. The exact association is not really well understood at this point. Like one of the old Harvard deans said, about 50% of what we teach you will be wrong. The problem is, we don't know what 50%. Luckily, the field's always evolving. Entrotrigo is another skin infection that we'll see compared later on to impetigo and cellulitis. This is a superficial skin infection and irritation generally associated with diaper rash or rash under fat flaps or breast tissue, anywhere that a lot of moisture can collect, allowing the bacteria already present in the skin to start irritating the skin, our body's defensive walls. Treatment usually consists of drying the area. Necrotizing fasciitis is a more serious skin infection and soft tissue infection, leading to tissue breakdown. To be clear, this list of diseases that we're covering is not by any means exhaustive. These are some of the more frequent diseases associated with the bacteria, but there are always other diseases associated with each bacteria we're going to discuss. For simplicity and sake of your brain, these are a concentration of the most common and the ones you're more likely to mix up clinically. Necrotizing fasciitis or neck fasci is fairly distinctive and then it causes this foul smelling tissue necrosis. This infection, if not cleaned and treated soon, can lead to loss of limb, sepsis, and become fatal. On to strep agalactiae. This is another one that we'll see in the urogenital tract. However, this one is generally asymptomatic in carriers. Babies, on the other hand, don't necessarily have protection yet. Their immune systems aren't developed. This is why strep agalactiae is a main pathological concern in OBGYN specialties, and why all pregnant women should be tested for colonization in their third trimester. Severe neonatal infection leads to meningitis, pneumonia, and sepsis. Testing and treatment of pregnant women is a quick and easy preventative measure. With strep pneumonia, the obvious disease is going to be pneumonia. The microbe colonizes the respiratory tract. Here we see a lung field on x-ray where the entire lung is cloudy. A healthy lung should be fairly clear, which appears black on an x-ray. Generally, you don't see an infection to this degree, assuming the infection was caught early enough. With bacterial infections, you'll see a lobular infection. Strep pneumo also causes the majority of cases of adult meningitis. It's important to know adult meningitis here, as a lot of pneumonia and meningitis pathogens can look similar and present similarly. However, H can be an important clue to deciding if it's strep pneumo or another microbe that's causing the patient's disease. Lastly, it's the most common type of otitis media, or ear infection. We've probably all had several ear infections in our lifetime. This bacteria might be the one to blame. Though there are other causes of ear infection as well, this one's the most common. Recurrent ear infections are not only annoying, but can lead to permanent hearing loss and even hint towards a more serious immunodeficiency. Viridin strep is a group of streptococcus that doesn't really fit in with the others. Viridin is normally found in the human mouth, along with many other types of bacteria. It's interesting that the human bite is actually much more dangerous than most animal bites, including dogs and cats. After dental procedures, as you probably noticed from flossing, you might end up with bleeding gums. These open wounds allow for hematogenous spread of bacteria that's already in your mouth to other parts of your body. This is another pathway in which a bacteria may latch onto the heart tissue, causing endocarditis. 
I know we've had several microbes so far that cause this disease, and we'll review all of them at the end of this module. The last group to discuss in the gram-positive cocci is group D strep, or the enterococcus. Enterococcus is normal flora in the human gastrointestinal tract, or GIT. Like most bacteria in our guts, they keep each other balanced until something throws them out of whack. In particular, enterococcus can be a concern if there's a penetrating wound, such as a stab wound or a gunshot to the abdomen. And I know you're probably getting sick of everything we're discussing causing endocarditis, but we have one more to add to the list here. You may be thinking, how am I supposed to separate all of these causes of endocarditis? How am I supposed to pick one from the other? Don't worry, in the next video series, we'll go over the different ways to distinguish between each bacteria. Here in the image, you can see the endocardium, the thin layer of the heart muscle. Then you have the myocardium, or the muscle that contracts, and then on the outside, the pericardial sac. The pericardial sac can be seen as a white ligamentous tissue. It acts to protect the heart. Also, because enterococcus is in the GIT and close proximity to the urinary system, in females this can be another cause for UTIs. This is an important non-staph microbe that causes UTIs. Also, if it grows out of control in the GIT, it can lead to gastroenteritis, which includes cramping and diarrheal symptoms. Strep bovis has more recently been moved to the group D strep as well. Though the reason is not really important, this actually makes it a bit easier to remember. First, it's also found in the GIT, though of non-human animals usually. Second, its pathology includes the GIT, so like viridins, it's kind of similar. Namely, it causes colon cancer. It's pretty much all you need to remember for this one. So just a quick review. I know we've had a lot of pathogens that cause UTIs. We've had a lot of diseases of the skin and soft tissue. We've had a lot of bacterial infections for endocarditis. So let's just sum them up real quick. Endocarditis can be caused by Staph aureus, Staph epidermidis, viridin strep, and enterococcus. For UTIs, you want to be thinking Staph saprophyticus or group B strep. For the skin and soft tissue infections, including bone, we have cellulitis, impetigo, erysipelas, osteomyelitis, and necrotizing fasciitis. For these, you want to think Staph aureus and strep pyogenes. Here in the image, you can see the different types of diseases and the relative depth of infection. In the epidermis, you'll see a more superficial infection, such as epitigo. In the dermis, you will find erysipelas, followed by the lower dermal infection of cellulitis. Below the dermis is the fascia, which leads us to necrotizing fasciitis. Lastly, if something makes it past the skin and deep enough, or travels through the blood and reaches the bone, then we can have osteomyelitis. Well, that ends it for this video. There was a lot of material, and if it's all new, make sure that you review everything at least one more time. Now that we can put some more common diseases to a particular bacterium, how can we tell if the patient has a particular disease? This topic will be explained more in our next video tier, the presentation tier. In the next video in the series, we'll begin discussing gram-positive bacillus. If you appreciate the material we are creating, the best form of flattery is sharing it with your friends. If you haven't done so, please subscribe to our YouTube page, like us on Facebook, and bookmark our website as we continue to create and gather more resources for your use. Also, join our mailing list to be notified when our new course material is released. We'd also appreciate any feedback you might have to improve on future material and direct the concentration of future content.